<laughs> well, I have a question that I found impossible to word accurately, and it was pointed out to me already that uh, when you're dealing with time travel, how can you talk about time as a fixed quantity? And, but I hope you can understand what I was trying to get at here. If you could time travel to anywhere, although it would be any wind if we're time traveling, but the wind is aware. If you could go to any time period and spend a day there, one of their days there, right? Uh, which one or what period of time would you go to? Just a general icebreaker question, and if you want to explain why, that's great. Open question, whoever wants to answer. I'd like to go to uh, the, when they, uh, the two were on the road to Emmaus with Jesus uh, because they told everything. Jesus opened up the whole Old Testament. Uh, Man, it'd be neat yeah. to know everything that he told them. I'd like to walk along with that. Ooh, that's good. That would be have to learn Greek first or Hebrew. I don't, which one would you uh, speak? Aramaic. Yeah. It's a language studies. <laughs> Maybe you could bring some sort of recording device and go back to the universal translator. Can we bring Google back? <laughs> uh, that's good. Anyone else? Yeah. 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 If I learned anything from watching Back to the Future, don't go back. <laughs> don't want to mess it up. All right. no. We'll pretend you won't mess up oh, the space time okay. continuum. All right. We'll just pretend <laughs> that you can go there and, and observe, but not somehow not mess things up. Right. Right. Snap back. Right. Right. Anyone else? Surely somebody's thought about this. Yeah. July 12, 2005. I'd like to spend another day with my son. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? You could go back in time. Revolutionary times. Really? To see the all the chaos of putting together the Constitution and the Declaration and things of that nature, mm. forming a new government. Wow, that'd be impressive. Anyone else? It doesn't say back. Can't you go forward? To yeah, you can. I was waiting for someone to catch that. Nice. Yeah. Time period. We can't time travel forward because it doesn't exist. Ah, <laughs> true. Theoretically, <laughs> non theoretically. You, you have a company. Yeah. Oh, man. In our history, but it's just when the. When our from our founding our, our, our I think I'm not to revive this no, like, Oh, like so, in, some like, of the early like, like the early 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 early. that when they had in Kentucky where oh. all the ministers came in. Oh, so some there. of the great revivals yeah, and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Cambridge. Yeah, that's it. Cambridge, that's that, it. Would yeah. that would be amazing. That would that would be. Anyone else? Yeah. I go for all the guns, so I'm going to say the resurrection of Jesus. Yeah! I'm going to be there sitting by a tomb waiting for. I just read that in my devotion recently. The bodies of several, several righteous men came back to life and appeared. And it's kind of mentioned as an afterthought like, well, you know, this stuff happened too, not a big deal. Because next to the resurrection, it's really not. But to us, it's like, hello? Anyone else? Yeah, I heard some murmuring about theories of time. If you get into that, my brain's going to melt and fall <laughs> yeah. be, be nice to me. I, I read a little bit of a book talking about different theories of time, and I was like, I don't know what I was reading. <laughs> I had no idea. It was so much. Anyone else got a place you want to be at? All right, well. It, for me, in addition to some of what you guys said, and there's so many miraculous, you know, any of the miraculous events, of course I'd love to go there and see them. But I gotta admit, I'm very curious if I could, if I could go back in time, even, I don't know, maybe, even 100 or 200 years ago, you know, roughly, something like that, I, I wonder if I could um, uh, 
past the sixth grade in our school system back then. You know, I wonder if I could have made it because <laughs> I just have a hunch I I would have. I think most of us today that think we're so smart would be like, whoa, what did these kids know back then? They were so, some of that stuff is some smart stuff. I, any of you read uh, uh, read some book? I, I know some of you have, but like, uh, any of you read uh, the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin? Have you listened to any of that or read any of that? That was just one example to me where I don't remember a whole lot from that book, but I remember him saying, like, oh, I'm just going to write in real simple language, you know, real sloppy, real easy, down-to-earth stuff. And I was just scratching my head, like, what is, this is not simple. This is not easy. This is, I'm having a hard time knowing what you're saying, you know, because it was, just the standard was very high back then. So I'm curious about that. I did ask this question for a reason, because we get to do a little bit of time traveling today in the story of Jeremiah, which I find kind of cool. Um, this was shared with me on Sunday, and I want to read this to you guys because it definitely really encouraged me, but I, I find it amusing. But this comes from uh, the missionaries that we've been supporting over in India, South India Church of Christ Mission. This is one of their, their newsletters, I guess, that they sent out recently. And when we were reading through this newsletter, someone highlighted something for me to look at here. And they're talking about their Bible college that they have there. They're trying to move to get accredited and some of these other things. But in the midst of their letter, they, they, they say in this paragraph, the doctrine is New Testament Christianity and the teachings of the Restoration Movement as practiced by our prayer partners and supporting churches. Since the Merritt Island Discipleship Academy, or MIDA, with the Christian Church in Merritt Island, Florida, has so many similarities to the discipleship training work of the mission, the intention is to harmonize the SACC curriculum with the content of MIDA's curriculum. Then they go on and talk about more accreditation stuff. But just thought, wow, that's really cool. I mean, they didn't talk to me about it or anything. But uh, so, when are you going to India? Yeah, you know, it just makes me think. Though I'm, I'm, I've only been on a few missions trips, but I've been told stories from some others here that have been on many and. It's as though, hey, you're going to do a sermon series tonight. Make it on Colossians, please. All right, thanks. And you're like, what? <laughs> now? <laughs> oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you, you're the main speaker tonight. You, know, you, just, you, you better get ready and go. You know? So I'm sure places in the rest of the world operate differently. But it's, isn't it amazing? We're living in a time where the things we do in a relatively small building in a relatively isolated place in Florida is being duplicated over in India, apparently, and there are students, if you can see these pictures and stuff, walking down that are that are benefiting from what we're doing here. I'm just, it's it's so neat when stuff like that technology can work to our advantage. So thank you guys for your support of that and for everyone praying for this because it's having an impact somewhere. That's great. So that encourages me. So back to time travel. If we could time travel, well, that's what we're going to do. Where we left off last week, our prophet Jeremiah was definitely in the down spot again. It was very hard for him. And as you recall, his emotions were definitely wavering. He, he seemed to have a little, in my estimation, a little bit stronger countenance, a stronger resolve than he had at other times because he didn't out and out uh, quit like he did one time. He didn't out and out say to God that you, you deceive me just like the... Uh, you know, just like the serpent deceived Eve, using the same Hebrew word, you know, you deceive me like that, God. He didn't exactly say it that strong like he did before. He even uttered some praises to God. He even said, God, you're, you're faithful, and I'll praise you for your faithfulness. But me, the day I was born, I just, I want it gone. I want, it's a curse to me. I wish I was never born. We likened him to the prophet Elijah. The prophet Elijah, even after a great victory, hit a real, real low spot, and he just wanted to die too. He wished that God would take his life away, and God uh, helped meet his needs and minister to him too. Well, exactly what transpired right at that moment, I'm not completely certain, because the chronology of Jeremiah is broken up a little bit. And it's uh, a lot of the Old Testament books, not all, but a lot of them are not written chronologically. Uh, and sometimes I think there are good reasons for it. Other times I suspect there are still good reasons, but I don't know what they are. I, I'm not sure. I imagine some cultures can relate to 
uh, events, history in a more of a topical sense, uh, and others like us are a little bit more of a chronological sense or sequence. You know, we like sequential things. But I don't know about you guys, uh, even, even us, we, we love a lot of these shows that are constantly bouncing around in time. And you got to figure out, wait, are we before or after the main character did that one thing with that one guy? You ever, you know, you know what I mean? I don't know about you, but that kind of, some of that rubs me the wrong way a little bit. I'm like, the story was just getting good, and then you backtrack 20 years, and you're trying to fill in some gaps. I'm like, what? I want the good part. But, oh. Uh, Bible does the same kind of thing, I guess. It, it, it doesn't always organize things um, based on chronology. But I think here we can identify a good reason <laughs> to not follow the chronology, but to skip ahead a little bit. So what we have here are some of the major kings that reigned. Um, and we're going to be looking at some messages regarding the kings. But as you can see, when we get to chapter 21, which is where we are tonight, we're starting during the reign of Zedekiah, the final king of Judah. So we are skipping past the reign of a couple of other kings and jumping straight to that. But then as soon as we get through this chapter, the very next chapter, chapter 22, we're jumping a little bit further back, uh, a couple of things prior. So you can see we're, we're going to bounce around a little bit. But why? Why jump ahead to King Zedekiah? Why jump ahead there? Well, I think it's because of where we just finished leaving off. We just left off. Jeremiah is so... Uh, in so much pain, and he's asking God, God, yeah, I just don't want to be born. Well, how much longer do I have to endure and everything? And I believe what chapter 21 tells us is the answer, at least a part of the answer to Jeremiah's pain and suffering. It's letting us all benefit by knowing that Jeremiah was vindicated. He was made right. He, he was declared to be the true prophet of God uh, in the long run. Everyone knew that. And so we're going to see a little uh, historical event where the king is kind of coming to Jeremiah with his tail between his legs, you know? He's kind of cowering over, and he's going to approach Jeremiah for help, this final king. And it's just, it's definitely a complete role reversal. The king, who was a high and mighty, is now down low and kind of humble, penitent, and asking for some help. And Jeremiah is the one with all the power really because God gave it to him. So that's what we get to look at. That's where we're jumping ahead today. So in Jeremiah chapter 21, the first verse, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord when King Zedekiah sent him to Pasher, the son of Malchijah, and Zephaniah, the priest, the son of Maaseah. Now, by the way, this is not the same Pasher that we just looked at previously different pasture. Apparently it was a name that was somewhat commonly used, so don't confuse that with the other one. Different pasture. The word of the Lord saying, please inquire of the Lord on our behalf, for Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon is warring against us. Perhaps the Lord will deal with us according to all his wonderful acts, so that the enemy will withdraw from us. Then Jeremiah said to them, you shall say to Zedekiah as follows. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I am about to turn back the weapons of war which are in your hands, on which you are warring against the king of Babylon and the Chaldeans, who are besieging you outside the wall, and I will gather them into the center of this city. I myself will war against you with an outstretched hand and a mighty arm, even in anger and wrath and great indignation, I will also strike down the inhabitants of this city, both man and beast. They will die. They will die of a great pestilence. Hmm. <clears throat> Zedekiah is so desperate that he's looking for help from anywhere, and he comes back to the old prophet, to the prophet, and says, hey, God's dealt with us wonderfully before. Can't you, can't you see if God's going to do it again? Can't God help us? Isn't there a message from God? Um, now, uh, this Zephaniah that we read about in verse 1, the, it's not the same Pasher, but Zephaniah would be someone who's second in rank to the high priest here. And we learn that in chapter 52, verse 24 of the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 52, 24. Um, 
And Jeremiah delivers a message about Babylon. Okay, you want to talk about Nebuchadnezzar, you want to talk about the Babylonians. Now, uh, I know we've discussed it before. It's been a little while ago, I think, in our um, study of Jeremiah. But the Babylonians uh, were a very <coughs> diverse ethnic group. Yes. A lot of times in Scripture, they're referred to as the Chaldeans as well. Um, and they're called that primarily because that's the ethnicity of their original king. He was a Chaldean. And they, the Chaldeans, as I understand it, were in the south of the region of Mesopotamia. And they, uh, during, especially during the time of Assyria, a number of years back, they were always a problem, a thorn in the side of the Assyrians. The Assyrians, as brutal as they were, could never seem to get rid of these people. And ultimately, they kept gathering people all around them to their cause. And finally, it was under the leadership of, um, of a king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar, or Nebuchadnezzar, uh, and that was Nebuchadnezzar's father. Nebuchadnezzar was the one that pulled a lot of them together and kind of unified them as a nation so that they had the power to rebel. And then, ultimately, Nebuchadnezzar, his son, was the one that could really capitalize on that power, and they were a powerhouse nation. So they survived a lot to get to where they are, and so that's where these people come from. And in verses 3 all the way to verse 6, Jeremiah is saying, okay, yes, God does have a plan. And yes, God is going to be influential in this battle. He is going to help in this battle. Do you want to know how he's going to help? I will tell you exactly how he's going to help. He is going to help your enemy. Make sure that your enemy, Nebuchadnezzar, wins decisively against you, Zedekiah. That is exactly what God's going to do. So you think you're fighting Babylonians. Well, there's your first problem. You're not fighting Babylonians. You're fighting God. <sighs> do we ever do that? <laughs> uh, I want to make comments. I've got them saved for later, so maybe I'll save them for later. But I think a lot of times we wonder why things are going wrong, why life is not quite clicking like it should, and it's possible that maybe it's because we're directly fighting God. We think it's about some situation or some, you know, earthly issue, but if you're in direct defiance of what God says, a lot of times you are fighting him and you're confusing it for something else. And you're wondering why things aren't working right. I just observe that sometimes. So you guys observed something similar? I bet some of you have. But questions or thoughts up to this point? Um I know for Lacey and myself, it's full of music today. It's like romance is in the air of this room. The men are quiet, the phones are loud. You guys are not nah, just teasing y'all. Uh, although I did feel like talking differently when I heard that. I just thought. So, you know, my wife and I, I've noticed we definitely have parenting styles. And mine's probably more the wrong one, and hers is probably more the right one. I just kind of figured that out. You know who lays the hammer down? You know who cracks the whip in my house? Yeah. It's not me. It's not me. I mean, I'll be the hammer, but my wife's probably the one using the hammer. You know what I mean? She's, <laughs> she's the one that makes sure it happens. But yet we tend to, in a very good way, I think we complement each other. Because a lot of times I just think, oh, I don't want to push too hard. Let's, you know, help it to be okay. Or, and then she'll say, no, you can't let this go. You can't just ignore this or whatever. Um, sometimes it's easy for other people <laughs> to adopt my super pessimistic style at times. It's, it's not that I don't know what's right to do, but sometimes I just want to take it easy and just, ah, it'll work, it'll work out, just give it a little bit more time or whatever. Well, sometimes you can make things appear easier than they really are. Um, just acting like kids will grow up fine if you just kind of love them and do your best. And I've read some parenting books along those lines, and I think there's a lot of power in love, but I don't think it's real love if you don't do anything harsh ever, you know? Um, a lot of times I observe the gospel is treated the same way. A lot of people in their efforts to bring people to the gospel decide that this gospel, well, it's good, but it's kind of rough, so let's knock off some of the sharp edges, water down a little bit, and then people will love it. 
problem is what they love may not be the gospel anymore. It may be something that you've created that's different. And it's, it's a lot of ministries out there have gained great popularity. But you got to ask the question, are they really teaching the gospel? Are they teaching something <coughs> gospel-like, but it's been kind of watered down? Or we've left out some of the truth, some of the scriptures, so that we can make it more palatable and easier. Um, one example of this, and I know you guys are on board with me here, but I'll bring it up anyway. Um, when you look at um, asking people, you know, do you want to become a Christian? Do you want to give your life to Jesus? What is it that you can expect to hear at any large conference or large event or television program? What would you expect to hear at that point? Just say this prayer. Repeat after me, you know, some of the effect. And then they say this prayer. And then some people have asked the question, where is that prayer in the Bible? Have you ever seen that prayer in the Bible? <laughs> well, you can look for it, but I'm telling you it's not there. You're not going to find an example of this prayer. So why do we do it? Well, because the idea, they say, is there. The, the idea. So we just, you know, simplify it or whatever. Okay. <laughs> Sounds very convenient, but... Uh, so there was one preacher who... One young preacher who preached for a large congregation that I believe had a lot of Baptist people in it and he made the comment during one of his sermons he said you know we talk a lot about this sinner's prayer and it's not anywhere in the Bible you know it makes me think of taking the lifeblood of the gospel and replacing it with Kool-Aid or something you think that's going to work you should see how mad people got at this young guy for saying that <laughs> I was online and I was you know, praising this guy. Way to go, man! You know, there's hope for some other church out there coming around. You know, and I love it when people are just looking to. Well, we are in a time, and I know some of you keep up on this, some of you maybe don't, but a lot of <coughs> Christian churches, independent, non-denominational Christian churches like we are, are tending to become more Baptist-like on the view of baptism to kind of de-emphasize it. I would say water it down, but that's actually the exact opposite because we're not baptizing, so there would be water again. Right? You guys, we're, we're tending away from that, but other churches who have been a part of that for so long are starting to read their Bible and realize, hmm, seems like the Bible doesn't really make us Baptists, does it? It just seems to say that we're Christians. And they start making some decisions, and I think some of them are coming closer to what Scripture says. It's just an interesting trend. Uh, you can see how Satan's working. Anyway, it's as simple as what we've been talking about. If you want to uh, change things, well then you may not realize it, but you're fighting against God. Because it's God's word, not yours. It's as simple as that. got to make sure we get it right, and so we got to be careful with that. Uh, all right, verse 7. Then afterwards, declares the Lord... I will give over Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his servants and the people, even those who survive in this city from the pestilence, the sword, and the famine, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hand of their foes, into the hand of those who seek their lives. He will strike them down with the edge of the sword. He will not spare them, nor have pity, nor compassion. You shall also say to this people, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. He who dwells in this city will die by the sword and by famine and by pestilence. But he who goes out and falls away to the Chaldeans who are besieging you will live. And he will have his own life as booty. For I have set my face against this city for harm and not for good, declares the Lord. It will be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he will burn it with fire. <sighs> the message is not looking so positive. Very definitive, though. The way of life and the way of death. So during the siege, uh, history tells us that what happens when a siege like this comes and what happened here is as the armies of Babylon are coming together to rally against the city, people all around the city who are in rural areas outside, what are they going to do? Well, they're not going to stay there and get sought out or hunted by an army. They're going to run into the city. So what do you have? You have a large population swell inside of a city while the city is being sieged. So it's a double whammy, right? 
the city gets a lot more people, a lot more mouths to feed, and then their supplies of extra food and extra water are cut off, and you can't feed those people. It is a tragic thing. It is a terrible thing. And so Jeremiah is setting it out there. God's putting it out there saying, here's a way for you to save your life. You want to save your life? Surrender to the Babylonians. Surrender. Which, you know, it definitely does sound counterintuitive, doesn't it? If you've been indoctrinated with the old 701 theology all your life, you know that God loves Jerusalem, God loves the temple, God will never let us fall. We are his chosen people. To hear some old prophet come around saying, ah, you got to surrender. God says surrender <coughs> to an enemy, a ruthless, awful enemy. It is hard to wrap your mind around, isn't it? Definitely seems counterintuitive. Doesn't it kind of make you think of someone who said, uh, whoever wants to save his life will lose it? Oh, uh, but if you lose your life, you're going to find it. Now that seems a little counterintuitive to me, too. Like, wait a minute, I want to save my life. Well, then lose it. What? But doesn't Christ tell us a lot of things that are on the face, face value? They are just counterintuitive until you got a little bit of wisdom and then you realize, wow, God knows what he's talking about. Sort of like the one that I remember a lot is you want to have a good family for your kids? You really want to help your kids be strong in the Lord? Give them a good life? Well, what do you do? Focus on your marriage, right? Because that's the best thing you could do for your kids is not making them number one, right? Um, well, same thing for yourself. Do you want to be a happier person? Well, don't be so fixated on making yourself happy. <laughs> Start thinking about others, and then you will probably end up being a more joyful person. Well, that's kind of counterintuitive, isn't it? I, I want to tell you guys um, about a book I'm reading um, that is just so funny to me because it's a business perspective book, okay? It's not a Christian book at all. I just started listening to it. But the whole premise of this book, it's one of those flashy business things of get rid of networking. We've got the better connection for you. You know, this is how you really get your money. And this, you know, they hype it up like that, right? So, ooh, okay, we're going to learn how to make a lot of money, and we're going to trash the old school ways of networking. We're going to do something new and original. You know what the new big thing they're talking about is? It's just old-fashioned relationships with people. It says, forget trying to go around and get business cards and care about other people. What you need to do if you want to be successful in business and you want to thrive you need to go find some other people and figure out what can you genuinely do for them and not get anything in return. <laughs> this is a secular business book, and that is what they are teaching people to do. And they're saying, look at these guys. They have, they have grown huge businesses out of that. They, some of these guys have gift-giving businesses that, that thrive doing this stuff, and they've flourished because they know how to just be friendly and relational to people and to try to do something for them and not benefit for themselves. It's just so weird because it's like, you know, it's almost like I'm reading something that I've read before <coughs> that was written a long time earlier, but that God told his people about a long time ago. It's just as, it's as though mankind was wired to work this way, isn't it? I just, I just thought that was so funny, you know? People talk about this new great revelation in business, and it's biblical principles all over again. Been around for a long time. So it definitely encourages me. So... <clears throat> Ironically, we're in a situation where Zedekiah asks for intervention by God. God does intervene against him. He is the one. So he's fighting against God. God's intervening on behalf of Babylon. Even though it seems counterintuitive, that is what needs to happen. That is where we've gotten to this point. So in verse 8, 9, and verse 10, he seems to shift his message to the individuals. And he lays out that formula, Behold, I set before you. Does that sound familiar to you guys? You remember hearing that before? Behold, I have set before you the way of life, the way of death. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30, starting in verse 15 and following, is, a, is another reference of that. This is a formula that we've heard before, you know, the principles. the way. Here it is. I've laid out the path. You can go this way, or you can go that way. You get, and we've even looked at a path a while back. You can choose the best way, which is to surrender to the king of Babylon and spare your life, or you can stay here in the city and you will die. And this is how you will die. He laid out that. And so that's just a reminder. This is the, um, 
This is the language of the book of Deuteronomy. This is the language of the law. They would be familiar with that. That is what is being put in front of them. And when he says they need to get out, he's using the same phrase that they would have, that would have been told to them in reference to Egypt. Time to get out of Egypt. Flee from Egypt. Well, now you need to flee from Jerusalem. And you see the, 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 the crazy role reversals that have happened here. King of God's people is now being warred against, and God is on the side of the enemy. People don't need to stay in God's city anymore. They need to get out of God's city rather than getting out of Egypt. It's just a sad kind of twist of fate, but it's something that we can expect to happen. And, and what a powerful lesson that was taught to me a long time ago. When you start going down the road of sin, all of a sudden the uh, easy uh, answer sometimes the clear standards of right and wrong sometimes don't look so clear anymore because you're in that fuzzy, dark situation. You can sometimes get yourself in a situation where no matter what you do, it's going to be bad. The choice that you make is going to be a choice that is some sort, you know, maybe it's an evil versus a lesser evil, but it's because when we deviate from the standard that God has for us and we start trailing down into the depths of sin, Sometimes it gets us in a place where there is just no healthy option. It's going to be a while before we get out of this. That's the name. That's that. I think that makes sense as to why sin would be a disease, why it would be uh, pictured that way in Scripture as well. Because um, when we go down that road, it is just a brutal thing, and it's sort of like what we see here. People have gone so far away from God that now there is nothing good. The best decision they can make will only save their lives. It will not save their home. It will not save the lives of their family members if they choose differently. Probably won't spare their health. That's all they got. Some of you look like you're going to say something. That's why I'm pausing here. He's giving them a way out, but it's not without um, punishment. So, yes. It's a way out. I wonder how many accept Yes. Not as many as should have, for sure. But, uh, yeah, it's a way out, but we're not saying it's a comfortable way out. Kind of makes you think of Ehud a little bit. He had a way of escape. You remember Ehud? He had a way out of that situation, but I'm telling you, it wasn't the best way out. But he had to take it, so you can read that in Judges if you want to get into that. Okay, verse 11. Then say to the household of the king of Judah, hear the word of the Lord, O house of David, Thus says the Lord, administer justice every morning and deliver the person who has been robbed from the power of his oppressor, that my wrath may not go forth like fire and burn with none to extinguish. Because of the evil of their deeds, behold, I am against you, O valley dweller, O rocky plain, declares the Lord. You men who say, who will come down against us? Or who will enter into our habitations? But I will punish you according to the results of your deeds, declares the Lord. And I will kindle a fire in its forest that I may devour all its environments. So the message we get in verse 11 and verse 12 is that the leaders, the royal leaders, they need to repent if this judgment situation is supposed to get any better. So, does that imply does that imply that they still have a chance to be forgiven even at this point? No. <laughs> Why do you say that? You just, don't, you just don't think so. You just don't think so. Well, you remember when we were back a few chapters earlier, God did make a clear point that, listen, you guys don't really know when too late is too late. Look at, look at this potter. Look at what he can do with a pretty messed up lump. He can form something else. And, you know, if someone's inclined to repent, then I'm inclined to do something different. God kind of made that point, right? So I want to be careful. I don't want to say that I know something that God doesn't know or that God didn't say. Of course, God knows it. I, I don't want to claim that. But my opinion about what we just read, given the context that we're looking at, I do not think... This is a claim that they can still escape judgment at this point. We have gone pretty far down into history here, and 
one of the reasons why I'm suggesting that is when we skip ahead to chapter 22, verse 3, and that would be a reference to put down here, uh, a cross-reference would be Jeremiah 22, verse 3, that's going to record very similar language, but that language actually comes chronologically earlier. I know it's later in the book of Jeremiah, but it comes earlier in history that this message would have been delivered, and it's very similar words about what the royal family, what the kings are supposed to do, to be just, to be righteous. My opinion is, and this might be a bad illustration because I'm, I've not really had a lot of uh, public work experience or whatever, um, but some of you could correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I envision an employee that's been told what they're supposed to do, and they've consistently been failing and failing failing and failing and failing and finally comes that dreaded day where the boss calls it into the office and let's just suppose he picks up a paper with a job description on it and he starts reading their job description you were supposed to do this and not do this have it done by this particular time in this particular fashion right before he fires the guy right now, what reason would there be for a boss to do that? Why would he read something that the, the guy can't fix now? Is there a reason for it? Sort of from the guy yeah. delivering the fire engine. Sure, right? <laughs> Is fire engine a word? I uh, like I think that. so, but... <laughs> You've got it now, the uh, fire engine. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you, I mean, at the very least, you want to get it through the person's head. Listen, number one, don't sue me because that's apparently you do that for anything. But number two, uh, I hope you understand, I am not being unreasonable to you. I have laid out these standards for you. It's a job description, and here is what it said. You did not do what it said, so therefore you can expect this result. My opinion is, since this was already spoken earlier, and given the context of how terrible this judgment is and how he said you can't save anyone, but the individuals can save themselves, but that's it, this city is gone. I personally think that this is a message of uh, right before it happens, just so you guys know, here's what's going to happen, because remember these words I said earlier? If you, uh, if you administer justice every morning, if you deliver the person who's the power of the, the oppressor, I told you that a while ago. You haven't done it, have you? I think that's what's going on here. This is a reminder of what you were told to do did not do it, so that is why you can expect the judgment. D does that make sense to you guys? Why I don't personally don't think it's a, another chance. But I'm not going to say definitively that God wouldn't give him another chance. I'm not going to claim that. I'm just saying from this context, I don't see anywhere in the text that's suggesting that God is giving them one here. Uh, so that is all. In verse 13, we've got some allusions that are interesting. O valley dweller, O rocky plain, um, all who, and then it says, will enter into our habitations. Some of those, I, I, do you, does any version say it differently? Does it say Rocky Plain or does it say something else? Rocky Plateau. Rocky Plateau, I like that. I like that. Um, because that's kind of the idea. God <coughs> is pictured throughout Scripture as a rock. You know, He is. And also the idea is a comparison of the city of Jerusalem to who God is. And then he says, enter into our habitation. Um, that is also language that is used of God himself. You know, those who will enter into his presence or into his holy habitation. Uh, what's interesting here is it seems as though the city of Jerusalem is puffing herself up to take the place of God. It's using language that would describe God often, but instead using it of a city, of herself. I think that's what Jeremiah is getting at here. Like, you know, God's saying, I'm against you, the one who describes yourself as this rock, who describes your presence as my presence. Uh, just kind of alluding to the arrogance that these people have allowed to creep in and has taken them over, that this city has. So that's kind of the illusion. And then you get to the 14th verse, and he talks about the forest. Uh, what does he say? But I will punish you according to the results of your deeds, declares the Lord, and I will kindle a fire in its forests that I may devour. 
Um, forest is sometimes, and I believe here, used as an allusion to a palace. A couple of references would be 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 2. 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 2, and then Isaiah chapter 22, verse 8. Sometimes when we talk about the forest or the trees, we are actually referring to the palace in figurative language. And one reason for that would probably be because of the trees that they would use to build these magnificent superstructures. Some of these amazing trees um, describe what they're built from. And so sometimes the figurative picture, figurative picture sometimes is that. Um, and we're going to get into that a little bit more in the next chapter. But are there any questions before we jump out of this chapter? Or any comments? Well, it's just interesting that they have drifted so far away, but they still believe that they are, you know, God's chosen, God's loved people, that they're doing no wrong. You know, and yet here, here he is, he's ready to take the sword in and say, that's it. But that's, I mean, you know, and how long does that take to, as you start to deviate from God's word? And you're talking about some of the churches and stuff these days. As we start to deviate to make it more palatable to people, then it becomes easier and easier to deviate. And now we're in a position where a whole church is, thanks to their, you know, under God's grace, and they've done nothing that, according to what the actual scripture is. Yeah. And, you know, and they're still lost. So it's just... A dangerous road to travel to when you start to deviate you start down to rationalize or justify your actions and you know you can start veering veering down that path and the next thing you know you're you're, you're nowhere close to where you should be mm. I really agree with that I think that's so true and I think we see it I think we've been seeing it for a while and the sad thing to me is I, I really don't think a lot of them see it at all. Yeah. I, just like what we're seeing here in Jeremiah, I think a lot of, I still think a lot of these people were very genuine. I really do. I, I don't see any reason to not think that. But just they, they were deluded regardless. They, their head was in the sand. They were ignoring a number of things. So definitely brings some pause, doesn't it? I don't want my head to be in the sand. I don't want to ignore some obvious red flags and stuff. I mean, when God himself is saying, <clears throat> I'm on the side of your enemy, hello. And you're just, no, we're good. We're in Jerusalem. We're in the temple. I'm going to go to the temple today. Oh, uh, man, that's so true. You know, thom uh, thomas, huh? thoughts or comments? That was 1 Kings 1. Oh, 1 Kings 7, verse 2, and Isaiah 22, 8 were a couple of places where they, they would take a forest or trees, I believe, and... Uh, picture it as a palace in figurative language, not literally, but they were literally built up a lot of that cedar trees and wood and stuff. Um, so chapter 22, which we can start getting into, is jumping way back. So remember, we were just over here in the reign of the last king Zedekiah. Why did we jump there? Again, reminder, I think it's because Jeremiah was feeling so down and so helpless and so God lets us, the reader, see, I vindicated him. Look, look at Zedekiah. Look at the message that was spoken. He clearly is giving up. It's, it's, it's over. So God proves, I'm going to vindicate my people, and I always do. God's always faithful, and he's been that. So he skips ahead in the chronology, and we see that in the book of Jeremiah, but now we're jumping back a bit, and that's where chapter 22 is. And in chapter 22, we're going to see some similar uh, language that's, uh, that he talked about before. So that is where we are in the 22nd chapter, and let's get into it for a little bit. Thus says the Lord, Go down to the house of the king of Judah, and there speak this word. And remember, we're talking about a different king now. And say, Hear the word of the Lord, O king of Judah, who sits on David's throne, you and your servants and your people who enter these gates. Thus says the Lord, Do justice and righteousness, and deliver the one who has been robbed from the power of his oppressor. That's the language I was talking about just a few verses before in the previous chapter. Same kind of language. It sounds very familiar. Uh, deliver who has been robbed from the power of his oppressor, and do not mistreat or do violence to the stranger, the orphan, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place. For if you men will indeed perform this thing, then kings will enter the gates of this house. 
sitting on David's place, on his throne, riding in chariots and on horses, even the king himself and his servants and his people. But if you will not obey these words, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that this house will become a desolation. This message that Jeremiah gives, see who he's giving it to, go down to the house of the king. This is King Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim is a dangerous king, a powerful king. He could go on record as one of the first textual uh, assassins, I guess, <laughs> because he chopped up words of scripture and yeah. burned them. Yeah. Yeah, so he's one of the early attackers of the Bible. Um, Jeremiah having to go confront this type of a king was akin to saying, you know what, you might die. This might be the last day that you live, but I don't care, go tell them. So Jeremiah bringing a message like this to this particular person is a scary thing. This king has killed before, and in chapter 26 we're going to see uh, an example of that, of him killing someone that he does not agree with. So in addition to murder... This king also had heavy taxation. We all love that, right? We can, we, we can grieve that. But it, it's kind of akin to, remember the other king that people later on after his life said, oh, he just taxed us so, so much. I wish he could, you know, the next king could make it easier. Uh, king Solomon, very wise king, but he did have a heavy burden on the people because he built all this stuff. You know, he accumulated all this wealth and everything. Well, this seems to be the last king of Judah that could follow somewhat in the Solomon footsteps. He built large structures for himself. He accumulated a decent amount of wealth. He was probably the last prominent king as far as a wealthy one would be concerned. There were other kings after him, but he was one that had some power, and that power seemed to go to his head a bit. So he attacks the people heavily, and he built nice structures for himself. And so this is... Uh, the message that he gives to that king. And that message is the same one that we just saw last chapter, but chronologically happens two kings later to Zedekiah. That's why I think here there might be a chance I think he's talking about. You guys need to clean up your act. But when he repeats it, I don't think there's a chance there. So that's what he's getting at here. And what's what's funny, verse 4, does that remind you? He said, you know what, kings, they're going to keep going in, the, you know, Everything's going to be functioning like they used to, uh, like normal. You remember another time when Jeremiah said that? He said, guys, if you just do this one thing, then, then kings and royalty and merchants, they'll keep coming in and coming out. Business as usual. Things will be good. Do you remember what that one thing was? So, That's it. The Sabbath day. If you just reinstitute that. It's like, if the whole law is too hard for you, let's just start with one. Start with that one. We'll work with that. And they never did it. They never did it. Well, same kind of language here that he gave in his, Jeremiah gave in his Sabbath sermon. And scripture tells us if God wants to swear by the greatest thing possible for him to swear by, what does he swear by? Himself. himself. Because there's nothing, nothing greater, nothing better for him to swear by. So God is. Uh, I, I just think about how fed up he must be sometimes, but he's swearing by himself. It's the highest thing that he can, the highest authority he can appeal to, but they're already not respecting his authority. It's just kind of a sad thing. All right, we got enough time to go a little bit further. Verse 6, For thus says the Lord, Concerning the house of the king of Judah, you are like Gilead to me, like the summit of Lebanon. Yet most assuredly I will make you like a wilderness, like cities which are not inhabited. For I will set apart destroyers against you, each with his weapons, and they will cut down your choicest cedars and throw them on the fire. Many nations will pass by this city, and they will say to one another, Why has the Lord done thus to this great city? Then they will answer, Because they forsook the covenant of the Lord, their God, and bowed down to other gods and served them. So the summit of Lebanon in verse 6 had some of the best trees in that area. You hear about the cedars of Lebanon in scripture a lot, right? And that metaphor fits with the royal house and what it used to be, what it once was. You know, the house of the king of Judah, you're, you're like that great peak with those great trees. And this is an example of what one of them, because a lot of them are not around anymore at all, I don't think. But they say they can reach 100 feet, 6 foot thick trunk. That is a that is a big tree, and especially in that area, as I understand, it's a very, very big tree. It, it got a reputation for that. 
But God is saying, you know, you're not going to be like that anymore. You're going to be desolate like cities that they're just not inhabited anymore. And he's calling destroyers against them in verse 7. He's using the kind of language, you know, I'm going to set apart destroyers. What is set apart? You know what it means to be set apart? We read this in the New Testament. What does that mean? Sanctified. Sanctified. It's another word for holiness, right? What Christians are supposed to be. This is the language that you would describe a holy war with. A God-appointed warfare. God is on the side. And that's what it is. But the holy war is God helping the Babylonians. It's God helping the enemy. Um, it's interesting that this language is, it's hard to figure out. Is this figurative language, or is it literal language, or is it both? I'm inclined to think it might be both. The figurative cedars, these, this beautiful palace and all the royalty inside, it's going to get crushed. But literally, the forests all around, when an enemy comes in and they got to make their weapons, they'll level whatever they need. They will cut down whatever trees and whatever resources they can rip up in order to help their cause. So it may be a double meaning both going on uh, to these people. So uh, in verse 8, in verse 9, people are asking why? Why did this happen? Well, I'll tell you why. Because they ignored the covenant and instead they went after other gods. This implies that people are going to be walking by and looking and asking how did this happen? I just want to suggest to you guys that the people walking by and looking Yes, there were other nations around at that time, but I think even us could fit that bill. We're reading through scripture and we're asking, why did this happen? And God's giving us the exact answer to the question. For anyone who looks, you need to know why this happened. They went after other gods. God wants us to learn something from this, right? This is what happens to my people when they go after other gods. Uh, and I have been told historically that even the Jewish people at that time, after the exile, never again, they had lots of problems. They definitely had many issues in their polluted worship of God and so many things. But you will find that they never again went after other idols or other false gods that bowed down to them anymore. All throughout that time, when you get to the time of Jesus, you see... You know, they haven't learned everything, but one lesson that apparently they have learned is to not worship a bunch of other gods. These Jews are very fixated or focused on their one God. They learn something. They learn something. But it's not just them. We're supposed to learn something, too. Any thoughts? Let's pray. God, uh, Thank you for uh, your willingness to love us and to be on our side. But, but Father, I, I just pray that we remain on your side. Um, we know our tendency to get distracted or to do other things or just to out and out rebel. And I'm asking for your uh, spirit to keep on convicting us when we do that so that we get back in line with what you want um, and uh, God just thank you so much for being so merciful for continually not giving up on us and, and allowing us so many chances to come back to you we're just so grateful for that God thank you that um, that we can see uh, history having already happened and yet learn something from it so we don't have to repeat it ourselves just want to thank you for all those things. Please help us to be strong disciples this week. Help us to take advantage of any opportunities we have to um, show the world what Christians are like. And it's in your son's name I pray. Amen.